These are people, I guess, going... Uh, I don't know where we're going to, but that seems to be the whole group of the butlers there. And they're heading off down that direction to, I guess, a new, uh, new location. Picture of the Nora River there, and looks like a little bit of a fall that they artificially created for running into the main tributary, I guess. <coughs> That's just across the other side of the north. Is that a building we're on the um, grounds of the, of the castle? I have a difficulty in projecting my meagre voice. Uh, I'm sure the mayor, uh, Malcolm Noonan beside me, doesn't have the same difficulty. So I'm going to call on him now to officially open the path. Thank you. Thank you. Clown, the butler, O'Kara, Coney Aaron Down, a foster of the Craig Sabine Starring Shop. Ladies and gentlemen, families of the butlers from the four corners of the world, you are very welcome to Kenny in this, our very historic year. For this is the year that Black Tom, the 10th Earl of Ormond, due to his kind favour in England, received on the 11th of April 1609 the Charter of Kilkenny granted by King James I. For myself as Mayor, it is truly a great honour to welcome you here to the home of the butler since 1391. Indeed, the 1609 Charter, acquired by the Earl of Ormond, was to establish the present system of Mayor and 12 elected members of the Corporation, and it is truly humbling to be the successor of our first Mayor. As I'm sure that you must all feel a similar sense of pride to be descendants of the Chief Butler of Ireland in 1185. You are now the very despair that many commentators are calling on as a possible solution to our economic woes. But while we grasp the straws to get ourselves out of the situation of our own creation, we would do well to remember that the cultural and historic significance to us, the people of Kilkenny, is our primary imperative. As we celebrate National Heritage Week, launched in these grounds last Saturday, we are very proud to have as our guests uh, in, this, um, in this wonderful time for our great city. This great culmination of all things special about Kilkenny, the Arts Festival, another September in Croke Park, hmm. and the Butler Rally, all bringing such a positive focus to our city. The Butler family influence on Irish civic life for over 800 years, still evident today in the wonderful built heritage here in Kilkenny, in Carrick, Hillcash, Feathered, Cairo, and other places. Broadcaster Owen Manny Mahoney summed it up well when he said, Numerically and historically, the Burks, Fitzgeralds and Butlers are the three Norman families outstanding in the moulding of the history of Ireland following the invasion of 1169. They have been remarkably consistent in producing able churchmen, soldiers and administrators. Their history brings them to the forefront of Irish history for 800 years. And as I was looking through the Butler family legacy, there were so many outstanding civic leaders who have had a profound effect on wherever they have settled. If a common thread exists, it seems to have been a pride in the name and a desire to make a positive contribution to their adopted home. If I were to single out any, it would probably be Edward Butler, uh, who lived from 1823 to 79, a Kenny man, who spurned his church destiny for nationalistic journalism and the Young Ireland movement. Outspoken on the plight of the Irish, he edited the Galway Vindicator during the famine years and moved to Sydney in 1852 frustrated at the continued censorship of his journalism. There he studied law and went on to become Attorney General. Edward Butler is but one small example of the influence the Butlers have had wherever they have settled. We are delighted here in Kilkenny that Hubert, the Hubert Butler Lecture Series has become a central event in our Arts Festival programme, the first of which hosted Samantha Power, who spoke so positively and assuredly in St. Canis Cathedral on that day of the unthinkable and Obama presidency. Indeed, I'm certain that given Hubert Butler's liberal worldview and championing of the cause of the oppressed, he would have taken great pride that his name would be put to a lecture, the remit of which is to espouse freedom of speech, <coughs> democracy, and the promotion of human rights. Finally, I would like to welcome delegates to the Butler International Rally to commend the Butler Society of Kenny locally for the great work they are doing, and to welcome you here to your ancestral home here in Kilkenny Castle. As mayor, I speak on behalf of all my colleagues at Kilkenny Borough Council, on behalf of the people of Kilkenny, we take great pride in the built cultural and social legacy that the Butler name has left on our city and county. We will never take that legacy for granted. 
and in this, the 400th year of our city charter, we are, like yourselves, mindful of our past, but have one eye firmly fixed on the future. A future I hope is bright and full of endless possibilities for us all. You're very, very welcome to continue. Thank you. I think uh, at this stage we're going to uh, adjourn. We have two photographs, I think. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay, we're not going to do that. What do we do for photographs? Do we all go up here or do we all oh, stay down there? there? If I just get down the steps down there, so down the castle is behind you up here. Yeah. yeah. Good idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just down there, no steps down there. So if you go down there. Can we just press the steps down here? Yeah, we'll leave them all down. Yeah. 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 It's nice the rain has held off again. Yeah, some rain last night. Oh, and wind. Yeah. It was banging away at a shutter all night long. Oh, <laughs> man. It wasn't nice. No, that's not bad. I solved the problem, though. I got up and I found what it was. Yeah, this step here, down on three steps. They all come down. There's a road room there. There's a road room down in front of it. come down on the front of it. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, that's, that's right down they can go back to the bed. Do you have a good flash? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, there's room down there in the front. Can I go to the bench? <laughs> This is the group from England. And that's the mayor in the middle there, of course. <laughs> they're doing it by each country. And, uh, the medal is put you here, there. She's the organizer of this event. people from all over Europe and uh, all over America. Some interesting people we've met. I don't know what all these people talk about, but... What happened to Quinn? Where is Quinn? Here's a view of the uh, castle from up on the rooftop of the Parade Tower. As you can see, uh, chimney pots a little closer there. Tipperary lands, the core of which are still owned by my cousin, my brother, and myself, uh, were leased from the Duke of Ormond and his mother, Elizabeth Lady Thurlis. A century earlier, according to my grandmother's family history of about 80 years ago, in 1559, those great rivals, the Ormonds and the Desmonds, both petitioned for that land. And the following year, the armies of Desmond and Ormond faced each other across that land for 14 days before a temporary peace was made by Joan of Desmond, mother of Ormond. 
With regard to Hubert Butler, who might best be described as an Anglo-Irish writer and intellectual, he came from the same background as my father, the Tipperary born historian Nicholas Manza, though Hubert was about 10 years older. And I find interesting points of comparison in terms of how what remained of a former ruling minority came to terms with a new state. I'm delighted that Hubert's daughter, Julia Crampton, is present, and also Lord Dunboyne, uh, who I've had the pleasure of meeting, and indeed I gather they both come from the same branch of the family, broadly speaking. Finally, I would like to review in the aftermath of a broadly successful peace process, the distance travelled and to be travelled in terms of reconciliation. Uh, in, any, in case anyone might think that Butler influence is a thing of the past, I first met your president, Colin Butler, uh, when he was uh, working in the office of the Taoiseach or Prime Minister, and indeed he moved into uh, the private office. He moved on to work in Aris Lutheran at the President's official residence in the Phoenix Park. Charles Hobby's personal political secretary and a very influential woman indeed was Catherine Butler, who is godmother to my youngest daughter, Harriet. The Butlers, like many families, including my own, are flung all over the globe. Few clans or families have their headquarters here in Kilkenny Castle, looked after so lovingly by the state. <laughs> Mary Heffernan from OPW is its gracious chatelaine, as she is a family, the former Guinness family residence, and Castletown House in County Kildare, which belonged to the family of the Duke of Leicester. In the old days, that would have required a huge transfusion of blue blood to manage, but for our days, Mary does the job of hostess beautifully. And of course, the Duke of Leinster's townhouse in Dublin, Leinster House, is the home of the Oireachtas uh, or Irish uh, Parliament, and I suppose that is one link, if you like, uh, um, uh, between the old Irish Parliament uh, and the present one. Those coming from overseas are all very welcome here in Ireland, and if I may say so, you will have a hard job visiting all the places associated with the different branches of the Butler family. So you will want to come back for further visits, and in any case, I find there are certain places, and this is one of them, which give so much pleasure that one cannot visit them too often. Uh, the Butlers, in origin, were an Anglo-Norman family, in other words, a family that arrived in Ireland from 1169 on, um, and subsequently uh, in the East and Southeast. There was a time when culturally and ideologically a newly independent Ireland was not quite sure what to do with the Anglo-Norman tradition. Was it the instigator of eight centuries of oppression? Was it simply the Anglo-Irish in an older form? but was it not also Catholic or Roman Catholic at the time? When discussing origins, the first thing to observe is that Ireland was originally uninhabited. Everyone's ancestors arrived here at some point or another. While there is a lot of mythical speculation, who conquered who, when, is for the most part, except in very recent centuries, lost in the mists of time. Were the Celts themselves one time a minority ruling class? The second point to observe is that everyone is of mixed ancestry and has traces in them of many different traditions, in addition to the one they are mainly identified with or themselves identify with. If one does the mathematics, each of us has two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on. If we go back ten generations, counting ourselves as the tenth, we have 512 ancestors, 
So the further one goes back, the more doubling up there is, so that we can be descended from the same individual a number of different times. On average, 10 generations would take most people back to the 17th century. It is easy to see why professional genealogists can nowadays always find an Irish ancestor for every American president. <laughs> it would be a very poor show if amongst 500 ancestors one could not find and document at least one that was Irish. That only goes back to the 17th century. Exponentially, we have millions of ancestors, far more than we're living at the time. I think it is a fair working assumption that practically everyone living in Ireland today, except perhaps the most recent immigrants, is descended from Brian Baru, the High King of Ireland, who defeated the Danes but was slain at the Battle of Montauk in 1014. Furthermore, I suspect that practically everyone living in Europe, or certainly a very, very large number, and I of course include Ireland in this, is descended from Charlemagne. We are quite literally the children of Brian Baru and Charlemagne. Now, whether any of their virtues have been carried down to us, <laughs> even in a millionth part, is much more doubtful. <laughs> if you ask who first gave me these insights, the answer is a distant Australian cousin with a German name called Beverly Kropp. And we share common great-great-grandparents. She's not very mobile, but is a fanatical amateur genealogist with boxes full of different family trees uh, who is hopeful of being able to trace us back to the fairies. <laughs> uh, the further back one goes, the less of an exact science the family history becomes. Imaginative leaps fill some of the gaps in the records, especially as touched up pedigrees could make a lot of difference in terms of status, career, and marital opportunities. A level of marital fidelity is assumed which might not always be borne out by DNA, and equally, black sheep may have been censored from family trees. It was not only Stalin that created non-persons, but patriarchs and matriarchs of the Victorian age, with a very different attitude from the 18th century to natural sons or daughters. <laughs> On the other hand, in the democratic age, we should not need to be reminded that a lack of documentary proof is actually no reason for being less connected. One could argue that the Anglo-Norman tradition was the key swing factor in Irish history, the reason we have an independent Ireland today rather than a country like Wales, Scotland, or part province like Northern Ireland that is part of the United Kingdom. Let me explain. I remember an entertaining dinner conversation about 10 years ago with Quentin Davis MP, then a British Conservative spokesperson on Northern Ireland, but who subsequently crossed over to the Labour Party. He suddenly asked me, did I know what Britain's biggest mistake in Ireland had been? Before I had time properly to survey the rich menu of possible answers. <laughs> he gave me his answer, which surprisingly for a conservative and unionist was the abolition of the old Irish parliament under the Act of Union of 1800. While a good answer in many ways, mine would have been different. It was the decision of the late Tudors and early Stuarts to throw overboard most of their Anglo-Norman allies, deemed to have gone native and become quite unreliable, and to replace them by new English and Scottish settlers, principally in Ulster, but also to some extent in the rest of the country. The principal dividing line was religion. The Reformation won few converts in Ireland where royal centralization had least effect. Over the course of a century and a half, roughly from, say, 1540 to 
1690. The two nations of medieval Ireland largely coalesced under a common Catholic banner to resist the new settlers and more authoritarian royal rule. The old English, as they were called, to distinguish them from the new English, became the new Irish. The later Stuarts, including Ormond, tried to do something for them, as they had suffered under Cromwell, but without much success. The butlers straddled the divide. Some royalist and conforming to the new established Anglican religion, others remaining Catholic. A young Tipperary historian, uh, David Butler, who I believe is possibly somewhere here, yes? Yeah? Uh, uh, hello, David. Uh, who is also the editor of the Journal of the Butler Society, has written a very interesting history of religion, land, and rivalry in South Tipperary between 1570 and 1841, which I would warmly recommend for an understanding of the dynamics of Irish history during that period, essentially a struggle for hegemony. A butler was uniquely placed to do it. Among his many other talents, he is also an accomplished organist who played at my eldest daughter Fiona's wedding in 2003 in St. Mary's Church, Tipperary. The earldom of Old Mormont and much of the land to go with it was granted in 1328. The history and memory of the Butlers and the Ormonds is today mostly present in connection with the properties many of them, as I have said, in state ownership. One of the oldest, uh, Kiltynan, um, I believe once owned by the Lord Stanboyne, near Feather County Tipperary, which has been put in excellent shape, is owned by Andrew Lloyd Webber, composer of famous musicals like A Vita, Sunset Boulevard, and Phantom of the Opera. So, the greatest popular composer of our time in that genre finds inspiration improvising on the piano in an old butler castle that looks straight up to Sleeve Le Mans. Kilcash Castle, further round on the slopes of Sleeve Le Mans, is at present being secured and restored by the Office of Public Works having been acquired in 1997. Uh, now, it was uh, certainly owned uh, by um, uh, the Lords uh, Dunboyne, um, and one of the family was uh, took the Confederate side in the um, um, Confederate Wars in the 1640s. The other end of the county, in the Barony of Ormond, the Round Tower of Nina Castle is being restored and will open to the public in around 2012 with all its floors accessible. And I've climbed the scaffolding of both buildings to view work in progress. A few weeks ago I was invited by the President of the Irish Farmers Association to accompany him on a uh, boat trip. Um, just to view some problems with the uh, flooding of the Shannon Callows. And we ended up going south from Banagher at Victoria Lock. Um, and there you can, as it was pointed out to me, you, you look at a, a tree in the middle of the river um, which divides not merely three counties but three provinces. Uh, behind one, um, uh, was Offaly and Leinster. Uh, opposite was Tipperary, and indeed the Ormond Barony of Tipperary, um, just uh, not accessible by road, just fields with cattle grazing, and, uh, and the opposite side uh, was Galway and Collard. A spot to visit once in one's life, anyway. Um, Carrick Shore is home to Ormond Castle, a Tudor fortified manor built by Thomas Butler, Earl of Ormond, who was a second cousin of Queen Elizabeth. Margaret Butler was mother of Thomas Boleyn, 
grandmother of Anne Boleyn and great-grandmother of Elizabeth I. And uh, for those of us who've watched the Tudors uh, film in Ireland, uh, many of these characters have become uh, reasonably familiar. A particular feature of the castle is the long gallery. Uh, Black Tom clearly hoped one day to host the Queen as her insignia are to be found uh, intertwined with his in abundance. Uh, earlier this year in May, I launched a fine illustrated guide authored by Dr. Jane Fenton, who is also an expert on Kilkenny Castle. And in the Office of Public Works, we're seeing uh, is there some way that we could strengthen the floor because it's on the floor of the long gallery, it's on the first floor. It would be wonderful for public functions and events, but at the moment uh, only about 14 people are allowed on it at a time, which isn't satisfactory. Uh, Care Castle uh, belonged to the Catholic Butlers <coughs> and was subjected to a siege by one of the Queen's favoured servants, the Earl of Essex. And one of his cannonballs is still lodged in the walls. He won an easy victory there, which did not impress her, because he reached an accommodation with the arch-rebel he had been expressly sent to suppress, Hugh O'Neill. So when he returned to London, this conquering Caesar was sent to the tower and beheaded. The butlers did not all remain in Ireland. There was a Walter Butler in the Imperial Service who organized and participated in the assassination of another overmighty subject, Wallenstein, during the Thirty Years' War, and the Emperor Ferdinand II rewarded him suitably. He figures prominently as a character in Schiller's tragedy, uh, Wallenstein. Ireland had its own near equivalent of the Thirty Years' War in the 1640s and 1650s, during the Confederate and Cromwellian Wars. James Earl of Ormond was the political and military leader of the Royalist forces, uh, more at war with the Confederate forces than allied to them, but both eventually defeated by Cromwellian and parliamentary forces. Kilkenny hosted the Confederate Parliament, even though both before and later on, Kilkenny was also the centre of the extensive Butler lands. Ormond went into, the exile, into exile with the future Charles II, and after the Restoration, he was the ruler of Ireland for about nine or ten years. His physical legacy to Ireland is impressive to this day. He was easily the most important owner of this ca castle, but he also constituted the Phoenix Park to the great benefit of the people of Dublin, and which is today managed by the OPW. It comprises several important residences, including Aris Lutron, the residence of our presidents, the American ambassador's residence, formerly the chief secretaries, and finally, the former Guinness residence sold to the state. When the papal nuncio's residence was demolished, Ashtown Castle was rediscovered within its walls and refurbished and acts as an information center for the Phoenix Park. The other great building the Duke was responsible for was the Royal Hospital Kilmainham, which houses today not only fine state rooms, which include a portrait of the Duke, but also the Irish uh, Museum of Modern Art. And the annual day of commemoration for those who died in all wars is held there each year on the Sunday nearest the 11th of July, the date of the 1921 truce, which ended the War of Independence. The Royal Hospital was the Irish version of the Hôtel des Invalides, built for old and injured soldiers by Louis XIV, and of the slightly later Royal Hospital Chelsea. And interestingly, one of the greatest concerns of the Commander-in-Chief of British Forces in Ireland, General Sir Neville Macready, when leaving in 1921, was what would happen to his beloved Royal Hospital. And after some decades of comparative neglect, it was taken in hand completely restored and is today being well looked after and well worth a visit. The history of this period has been dominated by two schools of history, one of which would be aligned with the Ormond and Royalist perspective 
Another, whose empathy would be mainly with the moderate confederate perspective, attempts to rehabilitate Cromwell's reputation in an Irish context are doomed to failure, however high it may stand from time to time in England. There are two major publishing projects underway at the moment. One, the editing and translating of the Rinuccini commentaries. He was the papal legate in Kilkenny in the mid-1640s and opposed to compromise with other anti-parliamentarian royalist or cross forces such as Ormond's. And the other project is the publication of the 1641 depositions held in Trinity College Library. In effect, a series of compensation claims to Parliament to be treated with appropriate caution because of that on the part of Protestant victims of the 1641 rebellion. Charles II and his brother James were, to this day, the most Francophile rulers of England, indeed of the Three Kingdoms of their time. Coming from a Scottish dynasty, their grandmother, Mary Queen of Scots, had been Queen of France in 1559-60 as consort of François II, and their mother, Henrietta Maria, had been a sister of Louis XIII. Exiled, though much of it spent in the Netherlands, Charles II, I discovered in Bruges last week, spent three years there, and the declaration of Breda was the prelude to his restoration. Uh, exile, as I say, had reinforced the French orientation. To the horror of English historians to this day, Charles II allowed himself by the secret treaty of Dover of 1670 to be subsidized by Louis XIV to reduce his dependence on Parliament. It was the revocation of the Edict of Nantes by Louis in 1685, in other words, withdrawal of religious toleration in France, accompanied by forced conversions and thousands fleeing into exile, that sealed the fate of any overtly lasting Catholic dynasty in England. When I was working in the French archives 30 to 40 years ago, I came across a prospectus, written in French, obviously, by the Duke of Ormond, inviting the Huguenots to come to Ireland. Part of it sounds almost like an IDA prospectus, uh, our Industrial Development Authority promotes inward investment. <laughs> the Duke begins by saying that in looking for another land to settle in, Huguenots may have overlooked somewhere close by the island of Ireland. A mild and fertile country, it could be almost said to flow with milk and honey. All the same, a man could starve there as well as anywhere else if he did not work. In days when there was almost no such thing as a conflict of interest, um, he could offer some properties of his own where it would be advantageous to settle. Well, of course, there was freedom of religion, this is a few years after Archbishop Oliver Plunkett had been executed as a part of the outcome of the Polish plot, it would be more convenient for all concerned if they were to conform to the Anglican rite. The Huguenot exodus certainly weakened France and strengthened the places they were going to, cancelled out in Ireland's case by the flow of the Irish Catholic leadership in the opposite direction to France where despite the comparative class rigidity of the Ancien Régime, they had much less difficulty rising to prominent positions than they would have had in the island of the penal laws. The Duke of Ormond had the unique privilege of maintaining his own jurisdiction. In the late 17th century, he built what is now called the Main Guard in Carmel, which would originally have served as his courthouse and was a courthouse uh, after his jurisdiction was withdrawn. And this jurisdiction was withdrawn when his son, the second duke, after the Hanoverian accession of George I in 1714, gave his loyalty to the old pretender. In the intervening period since, the main guard, which is an iconic building in Carmel, underwent diverse alterations until in the last century it became abandoned and semi-derelict uh, for the whole country. 
In the early 20th century, Kilkenny Castle was the center of some half-hearted consultation amongst Irish unionists, as distinct from Ulster unionists, against home rule. With the British Empire as its zenith, Irish loyalists, like American loyalists in the 1770s, were apt to mistake the balance of forces. As the Comte de Ségur was to write of young aristocratic society before the French Revolution, we walked on a carpet of flowers unaware of the abbess. And I think maybe the social life of the ascendancy prior to 1940 was a little bit like that. Mikhail Gorbachev also delivered a policy rebuke to the Politburo of the German Democratic Republic when they celebrated the 40th anniversary of its foundation in the autumn of 1989. I'm here under false pretenses to talk about genealogy because I know very little about the subject. Um, however, my father, Paddy Dunboyne, knew quite a lot and he devoted most of his spare time for most of his life to researching butlers and he produced an awful lot of papers. And I have a shipping container planted in my vegetable patch in Sussex, England, which is full of his research papers. And because I've got his records, and because I've grown up with it, I think probably a little bit of knowledge about butlers has rubbed off on me. Uh, but I'm not an expert and I don't enjoy doing lots of original research like he did. I get my kicks from going sailing instead. <laughs> um, anyhow, today I'm not going to talk for hours about butler genealogy. This is meant to be a forum and uh, I want to try to get other people to talk because in this day and age people are in touch by email, they know each other by their email addresses and they don't know who the person they're corresponding with is. And I hope that today the people who are here are people who are interested in genealogy, who have been doing their own research, and I hope that this will be an opportunity for you all to put faces to email addresses of the people you've been corresponding with. There is quite a lot of expertise within the society. There are people like Craig, who is a professional genealogical researcher with the Mormon Church in Utah. There are a lot of individuals here who have researched their own branches of the family and who know an awful lot more than me. So I hope if anyone's got a question about Spain or Latin America, we've got David Butler, oh. you know, who knows all about that. Oh. We've got <laughs> <laughs> Ed is from Australia, we've got Bill from America, we've got, you know, Germany, Russia, we have represented here today, Jacques. Um, so, someone in the room should know something about most branches of the Butler family. I'm particularly pleased that Sir Richard, our president, has made... Anyway, Nobody's ever seen you. <laughs> you see, so if you stand up and identify yourself. Yeah, and the opening, and I apologise that uh, we, I just got here yesterday. But uh, wonderful to see so many people here today. It's a wonderful opportunity to get together. So we'll, we'll see you this evening anyway. The social survive. Thank you. Right. And um, the other thing that arises from this is because everybody is using the internet and email so much for research nowadays. Um, I'd very much like to have some feedback about what people want to see on the website. 
Uh, you probably won't get it, but new ideas would be very <laughs> gratefully received. Now, Craig has prepared a little chat about sources of Irish family history. Um, like I say, Greg is a professional at this, works as an archivist in Mormon Church in New York. So, you better introduce yourself. The Family History Library, the, uh, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise commonly known as the Mormons, uh, we are well known for doing genealogy and having a very large uh, genealogy collection. Uh, the Family History Library is kind of the flagship of the Genealogical Society of Utah, which is the official name uh, for the society that collects the records, although we are more and more uh, going by the name that we are known on the internet, Family Search. So that's why I'm wearing the handy dandy little Family Search uh, shirt. Um, so that you can remember what the name of the website is, which I'm going to give you the web address in a, in a couple of minutes. Our ultimate goal, and I'll tell you right now, it's going to take a direct as to where the, the cameras go. And uh, so um, he would be the one that you would, uh, that you would talk with. Um, and uh, I mean, I'd be glad to uh, give the contact information because yes, we are interested in, in collections like that, particularly those that um, that are kept by the family and would not be accessible to the outside world in any other way, unless you know they, they were digitized and, and made available. So we would well, love to talk with you. <laughs> and so he had extracts of every reference in the index to a butler. And he, he was a fanatical family historian, and he worked on his family trees and so on, using these extracts. And then the Second World War happened, and all his extracts ended up in trunks in London, and they were all burnt in the Blitz. <laughs> uh, but the family trees that he'd worked on were stored elsewhere. So we have all his record, his final research in the Blake Butler papers that Craig referred to, um, which were based on the extracts. Um, very lucky, most other families haven't got that. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers Derek Bedson, who was a member of this society for many years, but uh, in the Cuban crisis, my father and Derek Bedson got frightfully worried about what would happen to the Blake Butler papers if a nuclear bomb went off. <laughs> and Derek Bedson was working for the United Nations, and the United Nations had a photocopier in those days, you know, there were about two photocopiers in the world. And Derek Benson smuggled the Blake Butler papers to America, to New York, and used the United Nations photocopier to make a copy and, and, and hid this copy of Blake Butler's papers in the middle of Winnipeg or something, which he reckoned was likely to avoid a nuclear attack. So, I mean, over the years, people have taken it very seriously, this idea of copying records and putting them in different places, you know. Okay. Um, one of the lesser-known branches of the Butler family is the Russian branch. And Jacques has very kindly said that he'd have a few words about the Russian branch. Born and living in France and uh, related to Russia. My father was born in the Far East, close to Vladivostok, on the borderline between Russia and China, on the river Amur. Later, he went at school in Sebastopol, Ukraine. 
where his parents then lived. He left Russia after the revolution in November 20, at the age of 19, having joined the Imperial Navy to continue the fight later against the Reds, as he thought at the time. But he never came back to Russia. He never saw his parents again. He arrived in France two years later and got a diploma in engineering. He made his career at the French company Alstom, specialized in power generation and manufacturing of trains and ships. The name Butler, like English or Irish name Butler, after transliteration in Cyrillic characters, was pronounced Butler in uh, Russia. When my father came in France, the public service hearing Butler registered phonetically in Latin uh, characters and the name gained a O, B O U. That is story. <laughs> my grandfather, Bronislav, born in Russia, was a military engineer. He was first involved in the construction of the Trans-Siberian Line and in the Russian-Japanese war in Port Arthur. Later, he was in the harbor of Murmansk for the protection against German submarines. Then he went in Sebastopol. He was in charge of the construction of a dry dock, the place for ships to be repaired. At this time, my grandfather was a general and the Tsar Nikolai II came for the inauguration of the dock. When my grandfather father died in Sebastopol in uh, 30, he had some official honors in the arrangement of his funeral. He died early enough to avoid being killed in the 35, as many officers <coughs> are being served state senate, in which the origins of my great grandfather, yes, were recorded up to the early 17th century to an Ernst Alexander, who was a secretary in Venden in Latvia in 1643, 35, 30, in 1634, by privilege of Her Majesty Vladislav IV of Poland. Later, for generation later, we find a Theodor Joseph who was included in the nobility records of Vilna government due to his proven noble ancestry. Vilna is now Vilnius in Lithuania. In year 67, I joined the Butler Society and attended the rally. I met members of German bootlers. I found in the, on their family tree an Ernst Alexander listed as a Royal Polish Secretary of the town Venden in the 1630s. It's therefore quite fair to assume that all sources refer to the same Ernst Alexander, 
as for Butler, linking one Polish branch of the family and its Franco-Russian extension to the German von Butler family mm. on the line von Butler. That's the history. But the history is not uh, finished because we belong in Paris to a group of descendants of uh, Russian officers from the Imperial Navy. And the group organized last year uh, a week in Crimea. So we went in uh, Sebastopol and Yalta. And uh, in Sebastopol, I could uh, find the house where my father lived with his parents close to the cathedral Saint Vladimir. And uh, after that uh, journey, we find information on the internet and we discovered relatives in uh, Nikolaev in uh, Ukraine. So in, in August, I went uh, again in Russia, in Moscow, and uh, Nikolaev, and we could meet these uh, cousins, and uh, some of them came from uh, Russia to Nikolaev and had letters written.